Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, seminar organized by the Norwegian Consortium for Research on Terrorism uh, and Organized Crime. My name is Thomas Heghammer. I'm a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment in Oslo, also known as FFI, and I'll be moderating today's uh, seminar. Um, I cannot overstate how excited I am uh, about today's event and uh, because we'll be hearing from Nelly Lahoud about her latest book, the um, Bin Laden Papers. Now, uh, for most people studying jihadism, Nelly Lahoud needs no introduction. She has been um, uh, at the forefront of research in this field for two decades. Um, she is currently a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation in Washington, D.C., in their international security program. She is formerly of um, IISS in Bahrain and before that at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. And she's previously published um, uh, several books and articles, including um, The Jihadi's Path to Self-Destruction, which came out some uh, little less than 10 years ago, and which I think uh, has, has proved quite prophetic for the, for the fate of the Jihadi movement. But we're here today to hear about her the Bin Laden papers, uh, which is about the Abbottabad documents. Now, uh, I think uh, two or three years ago, um, Nelly Lahoud uh, kind of disappeared. She, she, she retired into a, a cave <laughs> of sorts in, a, in, a, in an apartment uh, in, uh, in, in New York. Uh, and she came out three years later with this manuscript in her hands. Um, now, I have had the, the, the huge privilege of being able to visit her briefly in, in, in the cave. cave. Um, and I remember seeing papers thrown out over the, over the entire floor of the, of the living room. And, I, I, and, and this is a, an illustration, I think, of the depths to which Nelly has gone into this uh, document collection. And I dare say that she, uh, that nobody on on this planet has has studied the Abotaba documents more carefully than than she has, and I'm extremely uh, excited uh, to um, to hear from her um, today. So before I pass the word to to Nelly, uh, I just want to uh, tell everybody in the audience that the Q&A section uh, is open and I encourage you all to just um, uh, write your questions while Nelly speaks so that we have a bunch of, of, of questions to, um, uh, to tackle uh, when she's, she's finished. I believe she will speak for about 30 minutes, uh, give or take, and then we'll We'll, we'll delve into this discussion after that. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Nelly. Thank you, Thomas. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. Can I have it in writing? And uh, and of course, thank you so much for hosting me. As And also, as you know, Thomas, I have learned so much from your superior research over the years and the superb scholarship of several Norwegian friends and scholars. When I want to lift my standing in the field, I claim that I am a non-weary Norwegian. And um, speaking of Norwegians, um, I'd like to note that Anne Likuski turned out to be one of the reviewers of my book manuscript and uh, her comments immeasurably improved the, um, the book. Um, and I'd like to add uh, my gratitude to several individuals. Peter Bergen's support made this book possible. Uh, New America also afforded me the resources to work with two very capable research assistants whose contributions will become apparent in the course of my presentation. 
And I was exceedingly fortunate that the great historian of Islam, Michael Cook, read and commented on all the draft chapters of the book. And so did my friend Gary Apple, a brilliant playwright who read the book from a general reader's perspective. My editor at Yale University Press, Joanna Godfrey, Joe, championed this project before I was even ready to put together a book proposal. And, um, and I have to thank, uh, and I'm going to be thanking her for the rest of my life, the producer Ashley Valley at 60 Minutes to introduce my book to so many people who wouldn't know about my research otherwise. Um, I want to start by sharing the significance of 18 minutes to this book. The Abu Tabad mission was supposed to be completed within 30 minutes. Admiral McRaven, who oversaw the raid, had completed a study published in a 1996 book entitled Special Ops, and it explored eight historical special operations missions spanning the period between 1940 and 1976. His study concluded that speed was critical to achieving relative superiority by a small attacking force over a potentially larger and well-defended enemy. In his estimation, relative superiority is achieved if the mission is completed within 30 minutes, and any delay equates with vulnerability. In his more recent book, Sea Stories, Admiral McRaven recounts that while the mission was underway, Bin Laden was killed before the SEAL's 30 minutes was up, and to verify that the enemy was killed in action, the ground commander communicated on the radio, for God and country, Geronimo, 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 the code for we had gotten Bin Laden. But they went on to request additional time on the ground. Captain Van Hooser, who was tasked with overseeing the technical execution of the mission, explained, and I'm quoting, Sir, they say they found a whole shit ton of computers and electronic gear on the second floor. McRaven immediately recognized the intelligence value of recovering bin Laden's files. And though he wanted to stick with the plan, he still gave a go ahead, the go ahead. He kindly shared with me that at about 40 minutes, he told the SEALs to wrap it up. And about eight minutes later or so, we took off. So the book owes its existence to the perilous additional 18 minutes that the soft team spent in the compound in Abbottabad. And thanks to their heroism, we have about 6,000 Arabic pages of Al-Qaeda's internal communications, Al-Qaeda secrets. Um, I'm going to do three things in this presentation. Firstly, I want to give a general overview of the papers and the way I worked on them, then a panoramic view of the book. Um, second, I'm going to give a sample of one of the documents. And third, I'm going to discuss Al-Qaeda's fate post 9-11 as we know it, of course, from the letters. Um, I know that many in the audience know this already, but I hope that you indulge me as I explain briefly the process of working on the papers that, that Thomas witnessed. Um, I didn't start with 6,000 Arabic pages on my desk. Between 2012 and 2017, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI, declassified several batches of files, first through the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, then directly on its own website. The ODNI conveniently categorized these files, and so the internal communications were readily accessible. All we needed to do was to click. But in November 2017, the CIA declassified thousands of files, a massive volume. These were consisted of text files, audio and video. For the purpose of this book, and after clicking on thousands of files, I determined that the text files were the most important. With the help of two research assistants who are native Arabic speakers like me, we systematically went through all the text files, nearly 97,000 files. Most of them turned out to be materials that are available in the open source, such as newspaper articles, ideological treatises, and so on. But the bulk of Al-Qaeda's internal communications existed within these files, in addition, of course, to those that had already been declassified through the ODNI. It is only that after we identified the internal communications that my solo work on the book proceeded. The nearly 6,000 Arabic pages are brimming with revelations and allow us to put together a chronological account of the key events that defined Al-Qaeda in the decade between 9-11 and its founder's demise 
in 2011. They lay bare Al Qaeda's closely guarded secrets and serve as a corrective to existing narratives about the group, including my own. We have Bin Laden's own handwritten notes that reveal that it was him and not Khalid Sheikh Muhammad who came up with the idea of flying planes into buildings, and I'll show that in a bit. The papers also provide an unparalleled insight into the fate of Al Qaeda post 9 11, including the nature of its role in global jihad. The papers take us into the Bin Laden household, where nine out of the 16 people who lived there were children. We learn about their daily lives and we discover that most of the public statements we heard Bin Laden deliver over the years were effectively co-authored by his daughters, Maryam and Sumeya. The papers also shed light on ongoing policy issues such as Al Qaeda's mistrust of the Afghan Taliban, the effectiveness of drones as a counterterrorism tool, the continued questions concerning Al Qaeda's relationships with countries such as Iran, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And unexpectedly, I was able to piece together how Bin Laden's security was compromised by identifying who his real career was. He was not, as the CIA narrative claimed, Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti, who lived in the same compound and was killed during the raid. To be clear, I did not benefit from any input from the CIA, so I don't really know what went right for the CIA. But I do have a solid idea of what went wrong for Bin Laden. I'm happy to discuss any of these themes during the Q&A, but let me now show a sample of the letters um, so that you could get a sense of just one item that I think is worth sharing with this audience. And I'm trying to share, but it's not allowing me. Uh, am I? Is this, are you able to see this on your end? No, not yet. Um, not now? No. Uh, what about now? No, not yet. Maybe our tech stuff can, oh, there we are. Yes, we can see it. Terrific. So what you're seeing here is just this, these two very tiny paragraphs that are scribbled on a sheet of paper torn from a spiral notebook. And you can see from, um, uh, from the top that it says it is the birth of the idea of 11 September. And this is in Bin Laden's own um, handwriting. We see on the top, that the idea of 9-11 was conceived when I heard the news of a plane crash by its pilot, al Battuti. Now here, Bin Laden was referring to the plane, the Egypt Air Flight 1990 from New, Co New York to Cairo. And it crashed off the New England coast on October 31, 1999, killing 217 people. Now, the initial media reports mentioned several possible causes behind the crash, including its pilot, Camille al Battuti having vengeful motives against his employer, which was eventually confirmed. So we learn from these two paragraphs that upon hearing the news, Bin Laden said, Bin Laden wrote, I turned to the brothers who were with me at the time and lamented, why didn't he crash it into a financial tower? In other words, why didn't he make a political statement? The second paragraph that you see cuts right to the chase. This is how the idea of 9-11 was conceived and developed in my head, and that is when we began the planning. At the time, we learned from this paragraph that nobody knew of this idea except Abu Hafs, he was referring to Abu Hafs al-Musri, and Abu al-Khair. Now, in 1999, Abu Hafs al-Musri was bin Laden's second in command, and Abu al-Khair was, was another highly trusted member of Al-Qaeda. So it is evident from the notes that um, it was Alba Tuti who accidentally and posthumously provided the initial inspiration, inspiration for the 9-11 attacks and not Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as the 9-11 Commission's report notes. Um, Bin Laden's notes go on to expose the incompetence of at least two of the hijackers. Um, we sent some men to study English in America, Rabia Anawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Mahdar, they spent a year there without accomplishing anything. They used to send us letters to tell us that they were not successful at learning English. 
Khalid al-Mahdar despaired and returned to Mecca. He was too embarrassed to return to Afghanistan to tell me in person, but Rabia stayed there while Khalid al-Mahdar, and then, oops, bin Laden abandoned this paper altogether. Clearly, there was too much information that um, he uh, he didn't he didn't want to keep talking about this. So can I just take this out? I'm trying to see how I can. Great. So as you can see, he stopped writing, and the reader is left guessing how these two seemingly helpless men, Al Hazmi and Mahdar, ultimately made the list of 19 hijackers. Um, let me now turn to the biggest, the bulk, the, the main part of my presentation, which is to focus on um, Al Qaeda's fate post 9 11. We discover an afflicted Al Qaeda to use the description of its leaders. When the Taliban regime collapsed in December 2001, Al Qaeda was effectively shattered. Bin Laden had to disappear out of necessity and he cut off all communications with his associates. When he resumed contact in 2004, most of Al Qaeda's senior leaders were either killed or detained by Pakistan and Iran. The second tier leaders who were still at large apprised bin Laden of their afflictions. One letter to both addressed to both bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri read, and this was written in September 2004. Our affliction, and I'm reading, our affliction and trouble following the fall of the Islamic Emirate, the Taliban regime, were heartrending and the weakness, failure, and aimlessness that befell us were harrowing. This all happened, especially after you both disappeared from the scene out of necessity and due to your inability to experience our painful reality and to meet and converse with us. Bin Laden's associates made it clear to him that it was no longer safe for them to stay in the Afghan region. They were hiding mainly in the Fatah, the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. As early as 2004, perhaps even earlier, they feared being betrayed by a large segment of the Afghan Taliban, most of whom had been lured by the shiny dollars and turned against Al Qaeda. But Al Qaeda's leaders were convinced that God would not abandon his believers. So when God knew of our afflictions and helplessness, one letter read, he opened the door of jihad for us in Iraq. We should move all the brothers to Iraq, it said. Al Qaeda had nothing to do with the rise of jihadism in Iraq, and in 2004, it was Abu Musab al Zarqawi and not bin Laden who was the most powerful leader on the jihadi landscape. Fortunately for Al Qaeda, al Zarqawi wanted to join the team. He wanted the world to know, and I'm quoting him, we are the sons of the father, bin Laden, and that we are a branch of the original Al Qaeda and promise that the two sheikhs, Ayman and Osama, shall always be always, shall always be pleased with everything they hear about us. Bin Laden welcomed the merger in, in December 2004. One Saudi cleric remarked a few years later, and I'm quoting, God showed mercy on Al-Qaeda with the merger of Abu Musab al zarqawi whose group accomplished amazing victories for jihadis. This raised the value of Al-Qaeda's stocks, it was God's way of repaying the people of Jihad for their sacrifices in his path. Now, moving the brothers to Iraq didn't materialize. Though bin Laden didn't rule out this possibility, his first decision was to make his brothers hide until such time that they could resume international terrorism. So hiding, kumun, was an order and not an advice, he wrote. He authorized sending Hamza al rabia whom he appointed as the leader of international terrorism to Iraq, and to set up an independent unit dedicated to orchestrating international terrorism. But before Hamza al rabia managed to pack his bags, he was eliminated by a drone strike. Though Al-Qaeda continued to hide in the Fatah, mainly in North Waziristan, its leaders did not feel secure in that milieu. They maintained their loyalty to Mullah Omar and trusted that he was steadfast and sincere, and that was true. But the same was not true of the other senior Afghan Taliban leaders. In 2007, one letter describes that they had confirmed reports that most of the Afghan Taliban had joined forces with the Americans to kill Mullah Dadullah, a Taliban leader who was known for his uncompromising views against the United States and Pakistan. When this happened, 
Bin Laden counseled his associates to be vigilant, warning that most of the Taliban leaders, and I'm quoting him, have no qualms about being led by the intelligence agency of apostate states, a reference to Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI. Those Taliban leaders, he continued, accept establishing only that part of the religion that the despot allows and have turned their backs on making God's religion supreme. What alarmed bin Laden the most was the, was the prospect that if our friend, meaning Mullah Omar, disappears, they would succeed him. He warned his associates that the other Taliban leaders, and again I'm quoting him, would want to drag us with them in, in their path of error, and we must be cautious concerning them. Accordingly, any requests on their part that might lead to suspending or weakening the obligation of jihad on the individual, al jihad al mutayyin should be rejected. They must also be told that they are not authorized to enter into any agreement on our behalf, especially with states that are involved in the war against Muslims. Otherwise, we risk unknowingly falling into one of the circles that are led by state intelligence agencies. Beware not to share your secrets with them. Clearly, Al-Qaeda was not secure in its own milieu and its ability to mount international terrorism did not recover. Though its leaders cheered some of the international attacks attributed to Al-Qaeda in their public statements, their role did not go beyond being spectators. The CIA during campaign ensured that hiding became their modus operandi. Al-Qaeda's leaders refer to the drones as a calamity with which we have been afflicted. We have several documents that are most revealing about the drones. One of them suggests that Al-Qaeda's security committee believed that it actually worked out how the drones operated. Here's an excerpt. The work of this evil, meaning the drones, relies on ident identifying the target by means of human collaborators on the ground. They use a variety of tools. We call them shariha, consisting of an electronic ringlet or circle. We believe that it is simple. It relies on disseminating either specific proper waves or specific rays below infrared or above it. It is possible that they rely on another tool, a decrescent indicator, consisting of a phosphoric or similar color that the collaborator places on the roofs of houses, cars or the like. And it is possible that they use GPS to identify the coordinates of the targets. They may rely on identifying the target by way of taking images similar to Google Images or something else. But for this to happen, there must be a collaborator on the ground, a spy, who would inform them either by phone or other communication method that their target is at the location where the sign was placed. Al-Qaeda Security Committee reports that it was able to dismantle some of the spy networks and also believed that it devised security measures to evade the drones. It was simple. All the brothers needed to do was to hide. And yet, in its report to bin Laden, the committee lamented, and I'm quoting, after careful examination, we have concluded that the demise of all the brothers who were killed by drone strikes resulted from their own mistakes. The enemy's success is not due to their brilliance or modern superior technology, but rather it has to do with the brothers repeatedly neglecting to comply with basic security measures that should be clear to everyone by now. So what was going on? Two important factors contributed to the success of drones as a CT tool, both of which concern ideology. I've been reading jihadi ideological treatises for years, and I was disoriented when I read Al-Qaeda's Security Committee report. Four of the 18 pages of its report are devoted to a legal justification of their work, as it should. But the report highlighted verses in the Quran that stress the importance of security and the virtue of watchfulness. In other words, God commands hiding. For decades, jihadi leaders and ideologues have reminded Muslims of their religious obligation to fight jihad in God's path, of their rewards in the afterlife when they fight, and condemned those who neglect jihad and shame them as cowards and hypocrites. And yet, the security committee was now trying to convince jihadis that watchfulness, meaning hiding, and jihad are two sides of the same coin. Clearly, the security measures required in the Fatah were alien to jihadi culture. The other fundamental problem concerned spying. On this point, Commanding Right and Forbidding Wrong, the intimidating book um, of the great historian Michael Cook was most helpful. 
I learned from that book that privacy is very important in Islam and spying is unlawful. How is Al Qaeda able to combat spies in the Fatah? You guessed it, they had to spy on fellow Muslims. So remember all the jihadi ideological literature that calls on Muslims to fight against the policing regimes that prosecute, that persecute and spy on them, even in their masks. Well, you get the picture. Al Qaeda was doing what what they used to, what they used to criticize the regimes of doing. So of course, Al Qaeda's committee wouldn't admit explicitly that they were spying, but here's what its report say, it says, and I'm quoting. Our surveillance is the opposite of that carried out by tyrants. While they destroy, we build. While they violate God's word, we obey him. The tyrant's surveillance is farthest for God's wishes, as is intended to bring us closer to God. Their surveillance covers the believer or the infidel. Our surveillance is limited to the infidel enemy and his collaborators. It was a relativism of sorts, and they couldn't really defend it. In the end, jihadism's greatest asset namely the enthusiasm of men who do not fear death, racing to meet their creator, proved to be a liability in the face of drones. They took up jihad to fight in God's path and not to hide in his name. We find bin Laden urging his brothers to evacuate the Fatah altogether and to move them to other cities in Pakistan. His top associate told him that the men prefer dying in the Fatah rather than risk moving to cities where they could be captured by the ISI. At this point, let me say a few words about the events that were occurring in parallel in the jihadi worlds. I noted earlier Al Qaeda's mergers with Abu Musab al Zarqawi's group in Iraq. Now, considering its afflictions in the Afbak region, Al Qaeda initially benefited from this merger not least because it spurred other jihadi groups in North Africa, Yemen, and Somalia to follow suit. Bin Laden had anticipated that media processions of jihadi groups across continents, joining Al-Qaeda by pledging allegiance to him, would raise the morale of Muslims, who would in turn become more engaged and supportive of jihadis. Of course, he did not envisage hands-on management of these groups, you know, they were all hiding. In this, as in most matters, Bin Laden and his associates were guided by the Prophet Muhammad's example. They were inclined to think well, Hasna Dhan, of fellow Muslims, meaning those committed to jihadism in their case, and to accept that those who witness events as they unfold are better placed to make decisions than those who are absent. Put differently, Bin Laden trusted that delegating responsibilities would work just fine. Because he thought well of his jihadi brothers, he expected that these jihadi groups would devote their efforts to mounting global jihad. He miscalculated. Except for the North African group, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, regional jihadi groups turned out to be a liability. He disapproved not just of their actions, but also of their media statements. In 2010, we find bin Laden writing to one of his associates about these groups, and I'm quoting him. Some of the attacks they carried out should have been halted in view of the unnecessary civilian casualties that resulted. It does not escape you that Muslims' blood is sacred, not to mention that the Muslim public was repulsed by such attacks. It is necessary to reinforce to all the brothers the importance of being transparent, sincere, and fulfilling their promises and of being wary of violating their oath. I request that you ask the brothers to avoid giving interviews to the jihadi media, I previously indicated that such interviews are not suitably animated and lack the professionalism of those trained in journalism. This might give people the wrong impression, such as jihadis are backward and so on. Besides, the brother conducting the interview is often not qualified and struggles to choose the appropriate question. As you can tell, bin Laden had reached the end of his tether. So in the midst of being alarmed by the actions of jihadi groups, and while the drones were raining devastation on his brothers in the Fatah, bin Laden wanted more terrorism. Al-Qaeda's leaders in the Fatah repeatedly told him that we can barely move and our circumstances do not permit us to spend money on terrorist attacks. By 2010, bin Laden warned that Al-Qaeda was in decline and unless it changed its strategy, he wrote to his associates, it would come to an end as an organization. He spent most of that year devising a new strategy that in his mind would achieve a balance of terror with the United States. 
He methodically planned to sink a large number of crude oil tankers, carrying oil to the United States, prioritizing the largest vessels. He thought of all the details, large and small, surveillance methods, the boats that should be used to evade being detected by the radars of nearby vessels, the volume of explosives necessary, and the specific positions that they should be shaped to penetrate deep, deep into the vessels. I did not take his words for it. I consulted my friend, Commander Kurt Albo from the US Navy, who told me that for the most part, Bin Laden had done his homework. He knew what he was talking about. Ultimately, Bin Laden's goal was to thrust the United States into a severe economic crisis, adversely affecting the income of every American citizen. He predicted that the American people would take to the streets, replicating the anti-war protests during the Vietnam War, and demand that their government change its foreign policy and withdraw its military forces from the Middle East. To be clear, this was exactly the objective that he had hoped to achieve through the 9-11 attacks. And though he continued to refer to 9-11 as a victory, he admitted in his letters that the attacks did not deliver the decisive blow that he had expected. If the 9-11 attacks didn't deliver the decisive blow that he had hoped for, what made him think that sinking oil tankers would? By 2010, Bin Laden had somewhat evolved, and we find him expressing some restrained admiration of the American public, the original source of power in America, he wrote. It is well known, he wrote to his associates, that in America, power and authority are of the people and by the people, represented by Congress and the White House. It is necessary to focus, our, to focus our fighting on the American people and their representatives. The attacks on oil tankers, he hoped, would cause Americans economic pain and they would start to feel the great suffering of our people in Palestine and elsewhere in the Muslim world. This time, Bin Laden was not looking to shed the blood of Americans. He wanted their votes. But ultimately, Bin Laden didn't change all that much. And it's not that I was expecting him to renege on terrorism, but I was confounded by how little understanding of international relations Bin Laden had. To be sure, Bin Laden was well versed in Ali Islam, and there is much to be learned from the Prophet Muhammad's political acumen and military strategies. But Bin Laden's letters do not show even a basic understanding of the capabilities of the modern international system of states and the limits of terrorism to bring about a to bring about change on a global scale. By the end, we find bin Laden wanting to launch a new vision of Al Qaeda to tame his brothers, destroy 30% of the American economy at a time when he didn't trust most of the jihadi groups acting in Al Qaeda's name, and at a time when he couldn't even step outside his own compound. We get to know him pretty well through the papers. Of course, the papers won't change our mind that he was a mass murderer, but by itself, this description risks suggesting that bin Laden succeeded in his political endeavor. Bin Laden was convinced that by sacrificing his fortune in the cause of jihad, he was helping fellow Muslims who suffer the yoke of dictatorships. He firmly believed that if the United States stopped its support of the dictators who rule over Muslim majority states, the jihadis could fight these regimes on a level playing field and would easily bring them down. Bin Laden's papers paint a picture of a devoted father, a husband, a caring leader who worried about his men and their families. Indeed, the papers never suggest or even hint that bin Laden sought to advance his personal interests at the expense of Al-Qaeda, or that he ever entertained political deals that would have compromised his jihadi principles or his jihadi brothers. His supporters would find proofs in the papers that their leader was as consistent about his ideals and his private communications as he was in his public statements. But the papers also paint a picture of a man who miscalculated on so many fronts, and in that respect, he was incorrigible. Ultimately, he was a failed terrorist leader. By the end of my research on the book, I was also surprised by how the counterterrorism community had hyped up the image of Al Qaeda for years, allowing one of bin Laden's top associates to write in the same paragraph, and I'm quoting, Though we have not succeeded in mounting an international terrorist attack, we are nevertheless achieving our objective, namely terrorizing and deterring the enemy and engaging them in a war of attrition. Indeed, the enemy are spending much money on their security and are terrorized on an ongoing basis. 
They do not feel secure at all. They admit this and are certain of it. What I'm trying to say is that we are advancing, even if we do not succeed in carrying out specific attacks, attack because we are succeeding overall. Effectively, he was saying, we're operationally impotent, but they don't know it. Thanks to the papers, now we do. I'll end with this. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Nelly. And um, let me assure everybody who's listening that um, th what you've just heard is just a snippet of what is an extremely rich uh, account. I mean, every virtually every single page in this book has new revelations. Um, uh, so obviously, I encourage everybody to uh, pick up a copy um, and, and 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 read it. Um, it's very it's a very accessible. Uh, text much more accessible than the average academic book, I would say, while at the same time being extremely um, informative. So um, let me use my privilege here and, and um, throw in a question or two um, um, before we invite more people from the floor. Um, so I have tons of questions, but I'm um, I was wondering maybe if you could if you could um, start by just t talking a little bit about the the process, the, the, sort of the, the behind the scenes of the making of the book. I sort of um, I, I, I mentioned the <laughs> the papers on the floor, but um, how how did you go about this? Because you mentioned it, you know you touched upon it briefly in the beginning, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Because were you were we what you essentially were facing here was just like files and folders on a on a hard drive. Extremely difficult to get an overview over, um, to get it in a in chronological order, to keep track of all the references and cross references and whatnot. Um, so maybe there are two dimensions to this question. One is how did you sort of just logistically manage it, and the other one is how did your thinking evolve along the way? Um, is this the book that you set out to write in the beginning? Uh, so uh, I didn't set out to write this book. I had a very, very limited, narrow focus at the beginning. I thought I wanted something to handle it. Uh, a one sentence, Al Qaeda's contested relationship with Iran, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. One line, it would be helpful. And um, Peter Bergen said, why not everything, Nelly? And at the time I went along with it and, you know, trying to think that maybe, you know, I was too embarrassed to say no. And then, um, uh, and then he he was absolutely right because you couldn't do it any other way. When I it, it took me it took me a long time to work that out. It, it it you couldn't do it any other way. As I said, we I firstly I clicked on thousands of files. I didn't know what would be what, what's what's in the files because there were over ten thousand videos, um, the the audios and um, and so I as I said, New America allowed me to work with two very capable research assistants. I determined at a certain point I'm going to work on the files. It was the images and the PDFs. There was also the Word documents. All the Word documents that I clicked on, and I must have clicked on hundreds, if not thousands, they were all corrupt. But I started looking at the name files and I looked at all the name files and the Word documents turned out to be available in the PDF. So that's when I realized that the CIA had converted them to make them um, available. So worked on the PDFs and the images. The D PDFs, as I said, we so with the help of two research assistants, we, we went through them. My guidance to them is that I didn't want to take any risk. So anything because, you know, to work out if this is an internal document, it's not something that you need all of it. All you really need to, to read is the first couple of couple of lines. And often you actually realize if it's a newspaper article and so on. So you don't really need to spend a lot of time, but it is it is a it's a laborious work. And uh, so they helped me identify the internal communications of of the PDF. And then there were the images, which was this was another 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 problem altogether. Um, because the images, you have one paper, one uh, 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 one sheet per image. So if you have a letter that is made up of four or five pages, 
you have over 72,000 files here. How are you going to get to these to these letters? So um, once we work, you know, and, and then when when we were able to find these images, put them all together. Um, imagine having a pile of orphan socks and you needed to kind of put these things together. Fortunately, there weren't in the, in the images. There were not as many um, uh, uh, internal communications as there were in the, in the PDF. But here's where I was stuck. Initially, when I started working, I didn't realize that I could put it in a chronological order. And that's because I, I, I was not, I don't want to say lazy, but there were some of the, the pages from those images. Some of them were even just looking at them in terms of the handwritten notes, even looking at them was was would give me a headache because it was a uh, it was it was a lot of you know they were jammed with information and so on so I you can say I was a bit lazy and so I decided okay I'll work on the others but I couldn't really work out the chronological order so I thought okay I'm only gonna write a thematic book so I was able to write on the family I was able to write on the drones I was able to write on bin Laden's attacks and I have to say, I wasn't very impressed with my writings. They were interesting. No doubt we would have all found them interesting. But I have to say, I was. There were times when it's just like, you know, I had to do the if and buts and qualify and, you know, and 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 with that approach, I was trying um, and here I have to admit this. I was trying to reconcile the papers with what I knew already, and that was a mistake and that was a liability. Um, for me, so at a certain point, I started to look at the the, the chapter. I started to write the chapter of Al Qaeda's relationship with Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. Now, I had done some work, and I knew from the letters there's absolutely no possibility that Al Qaeda was collaborating with Iran. I had done that work, and it was very evident for me. But what I couldn't work out is that if they were so hostile to Iran in the first place, why would they go there anyway? And I needed, you know, for all the critics who are speaking ideologically or whatever reasons, I just couldn't address that question. So I thought, OK, I have to go back to these other earlier, <laughs> to the things that I haven't read. And this is where I immerse myself in the handwritten, um, in the handwritten letters. And that was that was just like, uh, it, 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 there weren't many, but what they did for me is that they worked out the time, the first three to four years, what was going on. Because prior to that, the middle period, 2005 to 2007, I could manage it. I was more comfortable with 2007, 2011. The middle period, I, I had to speculate, but I could manage it. What I didn't know was what was happening earlier. So here's the discovery from these letters. I find, I find these associates writing to Osama, briefing him on the past three years, I find out that they had tried to cross. The, their first attempt was not to go to Iran. They wanted to go to Pakistan. And so in Pakistan, they were met by uh, um, a campaign of arrest across all major and small cities, and 600 brothers were captured. So Al-Qaeda had no other option but to cross illegally, to go west, to head west. The north was impossible for them. Uh, um, so the only reason they could, the only other way um, is, is to go west. Now, I had learned from uh, a previous, uh, from my previous studies, Fadel Harun's autobiography, that in the 80s, those jihadis who were in Afghanistan wanted to help the Aziris. And so they wanted the easiest way was to cross through the north to get to uh, Azerbaijan. And um, and they couldn't. It was impossible for them. So they had to find ways of crossing illegally through Iran and had found these illegal routes. So clearly they knew some some aspects. And, you know, and this gets in, in other letters um, we know from the letters, and they always refer to them as the Belush brothers. There were many Sunni militants in Iran who were able to help Al Qaeda uh, forge IDs, rent houses, go below the radar. So clearly Iran wasn't able to 
police, its porous borders, um, and then and then eventually it started tracking down not Al Qaeda but the Belush brothers, and some of them and some of the Al Qaeda were betrayed, in fact, by the Belush brothers. But this is how they managed to track down Al Qaeda and detain them. So this was this was and, and at that point when I did that, I decided I was going to start rewriting the book. Now it wasn't from scratch. A lot of the work had been done, but I was now um, I was now moving in a chronological way. I now had I had the ability to put chronology chronology um, uh, uh, in the service of the book, and that really allowed me to reconcile the letters with the letters not to reconcile what I knew with the letters. And this was really the most, um, this was a very challenging thing, but this is, if there is something daring about this book, is that I decided that I was going to produce an incomplete narrative because there are certain gaps that I don't know about and some aspects in the letters defeated me. But after seeing the gap between what was known and reported about Al Qaeda and what the letters say, the gap between what actually happened and what reported to have happened. I, I didn't, I didn't want to reconcile the letters with the secondary sources. I wanted the letters to tell whatever story it could tell us. And I think even though we don't have the complete narrative, it's a very, very revealing narrative. It's, it's, it's very revealing and it, and it, 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 um, you know, at, at times Nali Lahoud is debunking Nali Lahoud, not to mention, not to mention others. So, so that was, that was, uh, that was a process. So, so let me pick, let me uh, pick up on on on, on that. Um, th this, um, I think, very wise choice to 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 deal with the collection um, as a collection and not try to sort of. Uh, evaluated against all the other material out there. Um, d d would, but I think that's a, that's a, that was a very good decision, but is there not a risk of then um, um, kind of taking everything that Bin Laden says uh, for granted? So for example, his claim that he had the idea of the 9-11 attacks on 31st of October following the the, the, the Batuzi uh, plane incident. Um, now, is it conceivable that he, that this is Bin Laden's kind of version of events, that maybe Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has another version of events, and if, they, if you put the two in the same room, they would actually agree that you know, maybe maybe KSM you know mentioned the idea earlier. Uh, Milan didn't dismiss it, but then the the Egypt Air incident kind of vaulted. I mean, you know what I'm getting at. So, like, sure. How? Um, um how sure. Sure that he's always kind of right. <laughs> and and no, and and he isn't always right. And and when you when you immerse yourself in the letters, and I do in some some parts in 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 the book where. I know that Bin Laden is protesting too much and he's being resisted by others. You get to know, and I, I, on certain things, we shouldn't take their word um, at face value. So when they start theorizing about, for instance, relationship between Iran and the United States or Iran and Pakistan, of course we can't take their word. It doesn't mean the truth. And this is something that we need to, um, you know, after reading all these, these letters, you need to be able to discriminate between what is authoritative and what is something that they are really themselves speculating and you, you you know after after immersing yourself in the papers you'll be able to pick on that and you and you can see it and there are times in the book where i put him in his place you know he's you know he's 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 clearly contradicting himself and you can tell from everybody else he is contradicting himself um but in this instance and um uh, uh, in this instance uh, i uh, firstly uh, he's not he's not really showing off about I came up with the idea. He is really talking about an inspiration. Now, of course, uh, and, and the other thing is, though Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is not mentioned 
many times in the letters, but in the few places where he is mentioned, he was missed and he was respected. So this is not somebody that bin Laden feels in competition with. Now, based on all the newspapers and the media that we know, Khalid Sheikh Muhammad and Ramzi Yusuf had been trying, attempted, attempting um, for years to uh, uh, to blow up planes, but their method was actually not fly planes into buildings. They wanted to use explosives. This is what, and they failed at that. And Ramzi Yusuf's, uh, um, you know, expertise is in explosives. And the way they tried to to do their 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 attack was was using explosives. I'm sure Bin Laden would have known about this, and they would have probably reached that point where, unless we come up with these explosives, we're not going to be able to do it. And and that was, and so when Bin Laden saw the plane, it's just it's it it really clicked in his head. Why don't we do it that way? Now, why did Khalid Sheikh Mohammed say say this uh, according to the 9/11 Commission's report? Well, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed did what every jihadi would and should do. He got captured and he needs to own it. And he needs to be blamed. He wants to take the blame so that he would ease the pressure on those who are still at large. So this is, you know, it's he's not doing it because he's saying, you know, blame me, stop looking for others. I mean, it's 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 basic common sense. This is what a what a committed jihadi would do. So I I, I don't think that there is in any competition. And if if bin Laden had managed to uh, to see Khalid Sheikh Muhammad, Khalid Sheikh Muhammad uh, before he was killed, they would have a very warm hug between the two of them. There is absolutely, uh, it's it's in no no way a competition between the two of them. Fascinating. You know, <clears throat> I really hope that maybe 60 Minutes or somebody else makes sure that your book gets into the hands of Khalid Sheikh Muhammad. Um, in Guantanamo Bay, <laughs> and that we can get his reactions. Uh, that now that would be some some TV program. Um, so we have a question from uh, Vidar, um, who writes: Thanks for a great presentation. I look forward to reading your book. I was intrigued by your comment that Bin Laden did not think the 9/11 attacks had achieved its objectives. Could you elaborate a bit more on what he envisaged? Relatedly, how did he see the impact of the invasions of Iraq, of Afghanistan, and Iraq? Was the fact that these invasions happened considered successes for the US, considering how, how they were extremely expensive and turned Muslim sentiments against the US? So I, these are several questions when we're running a little bit out of time, but maybe you can f focus primarily on like what Bin Laden's original plan. What 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 did he envisage with the attacks? Well, it's uh, the 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 objective is is really to keep uh, the, the same objective that he wanted to do with the oil tankers. He really envisaged that the Americans, he wanted the Americans to start protesting on the streets. And in early, not long after 9-11, in one of his public statements, he reminded them of Vietnam and so on. He really wanted to replicate the um, anti uh, uh, anti war Vietnam protests that happened and to withdraw from Muslim majority states. The word that he used, the expression he used, is a decisive blow. He really wanted um, the American Americans to start putting pressure on their government to withdraw from Muslim majority states. Now, and in what 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 all of Al Qaeda, and this is something where, as you were saying a little bit earlier, Thomas, at what point do you believe him? And we can see from all the letters, from all his associates, nobody had expected that there would be a war. At most, they envisaged a US airstrike, just like those airstrikes that followed the 1998 East Africa bombings. And there were many conversations happening in, Af in Afghanistan at the time. So they thought that this would be the end of it. They did not expect a war. And uh, it's only after the war happened and bin Laden having to justify it for himself, he'd say, well, we wanted to bring down the enemy. And in the same in the same page in his in his own notes, um, you know, he says, but we didn't expect it. So you could you could really tell and you you piece it together with the other um, with the other letters where Al Qaeda's leaders are making explicit that we really did not expect that. And what when when the war occurred, they didn't expect the they didn't expect it, and they didn't expect that the Taliban would collapse so so quickly, and um, they didn't have a plan A. And what's worse, and this is something again, one of the revelations of the letters, Mullah Omar, when um, 
when because we've all heard about Palama not being this political person that somehow it was his religion that prevented him from kicking Osama bin Laden out and so on. Well, when the Taliban collapsed, the Mullah Omar came under pressure from the tribal leaders of Afghanistan and he ordered all the Arabs and their families to get out of Afghanistan. And so really they had no plan A and that is why they didn't know what to do with themselves. Some went to Pakistan and they found themselves, you know, by by this campaign of arrest and the others had to go to, you know, uh, 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 to to Iran, where one of the detainees had said, you know, I would have rather Israel would have would have been even better for me than 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 Iran. So this is where I think it turned out that Mullah Omar also miscalculated, but he was not he was not a non-political person. He clearly made the miscalculations and my sense is because in Osama bin Laden's notes, he had no interest in um, in in um, Ahmad Shah Massoud. He kept part of the conversations that he was having with the Taliban before the attacks. Is it you are focused on this five kilometers in this in this part of Afghanistan and I am focused on the global powers of unbelief of the um, so we really need to be to be ambitious in terms of our projects and you want to focus on this insignificant soldier. And then um, we know, according to, to many, it's been documented by Ali Kuski and, and others that it was Al Qaeda who, who um, uh, removed, uh, who eliminated that eliminated uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud and this, you know, this IP, you know, this is a little bit of a musing on this part, but I suspect that it was um, a quid pro quo between Osama bin Laden and not just Mullah Omar, but also the senior Taliban leaders who were putting pressure and who were so focused on eliminating Ahmad Shah Massoud that it was a quid pro quo. We'll do this and you'll allow us to do 9-11. And by the way, I want to add, bin Laden did not act without consultation. He Everybody knew about the 1998 uh, East Africa bombings. Everybody knew about the OSS call. Everybody knew about 9-11 beforehand. What they didn't know, every, there was always consultations with, with many others. What they didn't know are the specific operational um, details. These kept, were kept secret all the time. Even bin Laden sometimes didn't know the operational uh, 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 details. Um, to maintain to maintain and to protect their security measures. So um, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, so I wanted to ask just like a big picture question at the end here. Um, uh, so um, what is your sense now of the Kind of the calibrate the way we calibrated the, the kind of the 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 war on terror vis-a-vis -vis Al Qaeda core. What, what, what was the was the focus on hunting down Bin Laden and and kind of decimating Al Qaeda core exaggerated? What do these documents suggest about the the state of the central Al Qaeda leadership in the years after 9/11? I mean. Could, could, was it necessary to 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 um, to spend all this energy hunting down this little group, small group of people? Could we could we not could we not just simply have just let them, you know, do that do their little thing, uh, and, and and then you know focus our resources elsewhere? And so and, and maybe another dimension to this question: um, Is there anything we can learn for? Um, other kind of in, in the fight against other uh, terrorist groups, let's say uh, so Islamic State has some kind of leadership somewhere uh, in, in, the, in the central in the <laughs> Middle East. Um, what, what can we I mean, can we can we can you can we make any um, assumptions based on these documents about how they are hiding, how they are operating, the constraints they are under and and so on. So regarding the first part of your question, Thomas, I, uh, you know, I 
I didn't I didn't think that I would be able. I mean, I'm surprised like you are about about how Al Qaeda was hyped up, you know, the 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 AFPAC Al Qaeda. And and I asked that same question to General Vertel, who kindly spoke, you know, spoke with me and I included his feedback in the book. And I said to him, if I said to you that the last international terrorist attack that Al Qaeda carried out was the Mombasa attack in 2002. And the reason they were able to pull it off is because the operatives had been um, had left uh, uh, Afghanistan before Operation Enduring Freedom. What would you say? He said, I'd be very, very surprised. I said, if it is true, what does that mean? He said, if it is true, then we overestimated our enemy. Um, now, I do want to say something regarding some of the intelligence reports. Um, I think there are two elements to this. Um, and stop me if I if I go overboard. The first one is Al Qaeda itself. The communications between Bin Laden and his associates were impenetrable until they were until they found Bin Laden. It's not something that modern technology or surveillance can actually know. So the fact that they were defeated based on the letters, it's very understandable. There that that we didn't know these these information. It's it's just like. They, it, it was impossible to penetrate this, this, uh, these, these kind of communications. Now, the other thing that is less excusable is Al Qaeda's role in global jihad in relation to some of the, relation to the other regional jihadi groups. And I say it's less excusable because some of these, the letters between Al Qaeda and these regional jihadi groups, they were intercepted, and Bin Laden knew it, and he warned his brothers, "Don't use the internet." And, but they ignored him. They told him, we're doing double e encryption. And he could tell from the media that some of the information in the media suggests that they had been intercepted. Now, you can say that we have communications with Russia at the moment. Does it mean we're on the same page? No. I mean, if they, the, the, kind, of, the kind of picture that was painted simply because there was communications between Al Qaeda uh, in AFPAC and some of the regional jihadi groups, it, it was assumed that Somehow Al Qaeda was orchestrating everything around jihad. The the AQAP in Yemen was supposed to be Al Qaeda's protege. You should see what a headache they were for Al Qaeda. I mean, they were insufferable from the perspective of Bin Laden, Atiya. It's it's just the the letters paint a, a harrowing picture. I mean, Bin you know uh, with with the with the Iraq group. We find we find uh, Ayman al Zawahiri, you know, a matchmaker. That's all he could do. He's just trying to bring these various jihadi factions in Iraq together. So it's a completely different picture that from the one that, the, that was reported. And I think, and even without the letters, you know, as as you kindly mentioned, Thomas, it's been very clear. I mean, I knew from my book in 2010, it was very evident since then the divisions within the jihadi landscape. Surely we need to pay more attention to to what was going on. And and it was much easier to put and lump everything together because, you know, it's of course, you know, they're all bad actors. So why not? Why not lump them all together? And I think um, this this um, uh, this this has come at a cost, particularly when the Islamic State really eclipsed Al Qaeda and gave the international community a headache. Have I gone out of it's it's I think should I should I stop here? No, no, if you finish your uh, your, your Yeah, so it's a, it's it's a, there were there were some 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 bad I you know some some poor mis misreadings of, of some of the intelligence that was being collected and I don't know why it you know there may be there may be some some other reasons um uh, uh, with regard to the Islamic State I'm much more comfortable now talking about some of the misunderstandings that we had about the early relationship between the parent group Abu Musab al zarqawi and al-Qaeda and I think it's a uh, we know a little bit much, much more now about how the relationship were. I was one of those people who thought that it was just, uh, you know, Bin Laden had no choice. Well, you know, in, in some respect, he didn't have choice, but I think the relationship with um, with Abu Musab al zarqawi he welcomed it and he embraced it. He was very, very excited about it until the situation, until until the promises that Zarqawi couldn't keep, and it was mainly he couldn't bring, he couldn't unify jihadi militants in Iraq under one umbrella, and not to mention his his attacks against the Shia. 
Um, it, it is, you know, I've been I, I've been working on on the Islamic State, but I think this is a completely different um, different group from Al Qaeda. In a sense, uh, they've wanted, at least during their heydays, they really wanted to centralize things. They wanted to do things um, centrally uh, in a way that you had their provinces. Um, they they were keen on on centralizing some of the jihadi media uh, uh, production through through one central market mechanism. And now I think it's a it's a completely different it's a completely different group from the one that we knew back in 2004, 2014 to 2016. Um, one thing that they might have learned is how to hide in 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 the open for Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. He was hiding amongst enemies, mm. and that was that was interesting um, from my perspective. So maybe Nelly, in five or ten years' time, you you will you will write something similar about the about the Islamic State because well, they haven't they haven't given us anything that they that they found in in Abu Bakr al Baghdadi's uh, that's right and I, and okay. and I think you know you this this book goes to show how important it is to go back and revisit important um, uh, parts of of history that we should never take the first draft of history uh, for granted, the first draft being that drawn by the media and sort of government uh, spokespeople. We should not even take the second draft of history, which is that of the, the, the initial studies and academic books that come out. Really, there has to always be a third draft that goes back you know, when this dust has settled and looks in depth at this. And this is what you have done, Nelly, uh, and you've, you've, you've contributed a tremendous amount of insight in the process, and uh, it's an example to be to be followed. So I thank you so very much for, for sharing your, your insights with us, and I thank the audience for, for attending. And I just want to tell you all to uh, go straight on Amazon right now uh, and get this book, The Bin Laden Papers. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think in 20 years, people will be reading two books about Al-Qaeda. They'll be reading Larry Wright's The Looming Tower, and they'll be reading Nelly Lahoud, The Bin Laden Papers. Thank you very much and have a, have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, James.